Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum, and we're on the road to Town Meeting Day 2020. We've got a whole series of shows. This year, we have a really rare occurrence. We have two open seats in District 3, one of which is the one-year seat filling Ashley Hill's remaining term, and one is the two-year seat replacing Glenn Hutchinson. Uh, we also have incumbents running in District 1 and 2 being Connor Casey and Donna Bate, and we have the school where all of the candidates will end up on the school board. Yes. And we also have Libby coming in to talk about the school budget, and we have Bill Fraser coming in to talk about the city budgets. All the shows are well worthwhile. Tonight is a really good one. We have Jim Murphy, who's the school board president. And how long has Jim Murphy been the school board president? Uh, since October of 2018. That's a long time. Yes, it's... You're, you're heading towards John Holler territory. Maybe. What's the school board president do? Uh, the school board chair just basically facilitates the board meetings, uh, meets with the superintendent weekly uh, to set the agenda, to um, convey concerns about the school board, to discuss items, to make sure that the school board is thinking about the things it needs to think about, is communicating well with the superintendent, um, and that uh, you know, we've got a good agenda, we're talking about the, the matters that the community wants us to talk about and that the school needs us to talk about. How do you ascertain what the community wants you to talk about? Uh, we listen. I mean, all the board members, I think, have a role as uh, community facilitators, as, as voices for their constituents. Uh, so, you know, my board members will, will uh, you know, tell me that they've been hearing certain things in the community they want certain things discussed. Um, not all things make it. Some things are more appropriate than others. Some things are, you know, oftentimes people try to go to the school board directly when, you know, calling up a principal or the superintendent could resolve the issue. So first of all, we figure out, is this really a board matter? Um, and if it's not, we try to handle it. As, as ombudsman. As own, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and then, you know, some matters are right for the board. So, uh, you know, that's, that's how we do it. We largely through community feedback. Now um, you not only are a member of the community, but you're a parent. I'm a parent, yes. Which school or schools? Uh, UES and uh, Main Street Middle School. So you've got both of them covered soon to be Main Street Middle, or soon to be the high school and Main Street Middle yeah, School. Yeah, next year we'll be two at Main Street Middle School, and then the year after that I'll be, I'll shift to the Main Street, or Montpelier High School and MSMS. Um, your older one was your child always in the Montpelier School District, or did they move in from another one? No, my kids uh, have both started in kindergarten. They both did their, they both were Turtle Island and Children's House, so they've been uh, in the Montpelier education system, you know, private and then, you know, public once they were in kindergarten. So, so being that this is Montpelier, likely their prom date is sitting in their class somewhere. Probably, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, if you could discuss uh, our Enrollment. You see the enrollment projections, and how long have you been on the board now? Four years. So you've seen four years worth of projections. How close have we come to those projections, the longer term ones? Pretty good. I mean, we've projected an upward trend, uh, and it's been a steady upward trend for the years I've been on the board, which is, which is unique for Vermont. Most Vermont towns are, are going in the opposite direction with a few, a few exceptions, us being one of them. Uh, which I think is a real testament to our schools. I think people are moving to this community because we do have strong schools, and um, you know it's also a great place to live. It's a strong community in general. Uh, but you know those have allowed us uh, to invest in our schools. I think in ways that other communities have not been allowed to invest in their schools because we we have advantageous tax uh, consequences because we are a growing. And we town. picked up Roxbury yes. in a consolidation. How long ago? Uh, it was official, that we're in our second year of the, the actual merger in terms of students being at both. Now how many students are coming in roughly annually from Roxbury? Uh, you know, it's the total RVS school is a little under 40, so you're getting on average, you know, about five to seven kids so per it's, grade. So it's really small in, in a sense. It's relatively small, but it, you know, it makes a difference. Um, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but no, I'm not asking. Know, 
about five to seven students has a significant impact in tax rates, actually. Um, so the more students you add to the mix, um, you know, the more you're able to, to do without burdening the taxpayers. Now, there was a tax break that the state implemented in that act in order to get districts to step forward and consolidate. Yes, and it's, it's a stepped tax rate. It was eight cents, six cents, four cents. I think we're in the last year of that. Um, we have a fantastic budget uh, manager in Grant Geisler, uh, who's done a really good job of forecasting ahead and making sure that as those, those tax breaks go down, um, the, there's cushion in the budget to absorb that so it, it doesn't become... So it doesn't become a, doesn't, a very large lump sum? Yeah, so it doesn't feel like a tax hit. Now, Libby's going to discuss this, but... Yeah. I just want to walk you really briefly through health care and its impact on the budget. Yeah, my understanding, and I do not pretend to have a full command of all the details, but my general understanding is that um, unlike some other districts in the state that are going to be pretty severely impacted by you know, the, the result of the, the statewide health care for, for teachers, we are in pretty good shape. It, it will either not really knock us off course or uh, it might even play out slightly in our advantage. So we're, we're in a pretty good spot in terms of, of the healthcare. And I think that's because, you know, because of the system we have and also I think we, we've got good budgetary management um, in the district. In terms of management, this is something that forever, I mean, I've been in this district yeah. or I've been in this town forever. <laughs> And um, there's always a question of the relationship between the board and the administration, the superintendent yes. and her administration. How do you understand that evolving in terms of responsibility, in terms of authority and accountability? Uh, you know, I've actually tried to focus on that a lot. I see, uh, you know, the board's role is, it, it's pretty high level. We, we actually kind of backed away from formal policy governance, uh, which I think everyone... What is formal confused. policy governance? Policy the, governance uh, is the idea that, that basically uh, you just set policies and then manage this, the CEO to see if they're reasonably following them. And the, you know, the policy is a very high level. Um, you know, for instance, in, in true policy governance, something like the budget is, is a consent agenda item. You don't really oversee it. And we felt that just given the fact that we're, the policy governance model is, is really made for like a nonprofit board. Uh, we're really not a nonprofit board. We're, we're kind of a hybrid between a board and an elected entity. Uh, and we do have constituents, and constituents have questions about the budget, and they want us to know th about the budget. Um, and they also, you know, there's some agenda items uh, that, you know, the community wants brought up and brought to a board level. Uh, that might not be appropriate in a true policy governance system. So we kind of backed away from that and acknowledged the reality that we have, you know, we have a level of detail and involvement in things like the budget and in things like, you know, the after school program that happened last year that just really doesn't fit under policy. So governance. So we still try to stay at, at a high level but realize that, um, you know, there are there are levels of involvement that the, the board has. But are you working on metrics um, in terms of acceptable scores, like in our proficiency-based graduation? Uh, we are certainly looking at those in terms of the performance of the whole district. And uh, you know, one, of, one of the things uh, that we've been working on is really asking Libby, and she's done a fantastic job of it, to start putting some data together about our scores and how we're measuring up. Uh, and really, the last couple of years has been the first time we've had good data about what our scores look like. Now, are you talking about aggregate scores, or are you talking about subpopulations? We're talking about both. We're talking about really getting the type of scores to get the overall picture of how our schools are doing vis-a-vis -vis other schools, but then also being able to delve into equity is everyone in our schools, uh, are they able to access the level of education they need? Um, are you know, subgroups doing well across the board? And you know, as you know, uh, you know, La Pillar does well overall, but unfortunately we have uh, students who are, are falling behind and we've had trouble 
um, closing that gap. In terms of, now again, this makes me feel yeah. like your dad, uh, but when my son, who's in graduate school now, um, was at Union as a small child, we were still doing portfolio assessments. We hadn't had the kneecap yet. Yep. We hadn't gone into our proficiency style graduation. We were years away from proficiency graduation, which I'll ask you what it yep. is. Do we still do portfolio assessment? Is there a softer side of assessment that parents are aware of besides the parent-teachers conference? I'm not aware of portfolio assessments being done. So Okay, they so they were, weren't aren't yeah. done. Uh, again, what it was was it was parents meeting and being able to see the child's work and the child helped assess their progress. Well, I mean, there's definitely the, at, at least in the, I don't know how it's done at the high school, but at the middle school level and the, the, the elementary school level, um, there are parent-teacher meetings that are student-led where the students come in and right. they do something similar where they show show their work and talk about it and you know the students lead those meetings so if, so it's still we still simple. haven't left the softer assessment of success yeah we still haven't and, and that gives the student I think an idea to engage their parent and talk about what they're doing and, and you know build confidence well that, that was the purpose and, yeah, behind portfolio exactly. What is proficiency-based graduation? So yeah, proficiency, it's a new law. Huh? It's it is new law. It's, it's a legal requirement that all uh, schools are moving towards. Um, it gets away from the uh, the familiar A, B, C, D grading that probably you grew up with and I grew up with. Uh, it's it's really moving towards the idea that that you're trying to teach kids skills and proficiencies that they can then bring with them throughout life. Um, and it's more of a focus on giving students the opportunity, one, to actually reach proficiency, not just give them, you know, a, go through a class, they take a test, if they get an F, okay, they get an F, it goes on the record, um, you know, they flunk and you don't go back and say, okay, let's, let's get it right. Um, and, and also the idea that, that skills kind of transcends a lot of subjects. So when you're in science, you're also, you know, you're writing, you're presenting orally. Uh, so uh, those are skills that you're building and, and skills that, that as part of your science class, you should, be look, you should look to be developing. Um, so it's the idea of, of really focusing on, on skills and building skills through a variety of ways and, and giving kids kind of the, the chance to keep coming up to to proficiency. So you know, at what grades do this does this proficiency testing start? This, this uh, the grading is, has started I think through all levels. Um, you know, as and you know the idea is that by the end of the year you want all your students at least proficient in the skills that they need to move on to the next grade. If a child is proficient in all of those skills at the beginning of the year are we advancing children up grades? Or? Uh, I think we are certainly trying to, to challenge children that um, you know that that need to be challenged. What about children who don't need to be challenged but need the challenge? Uh, a, a challenge. Let, let me. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying this in the most inarticulate manner possible. Yeah. But a fourth grader who comes in meeting all of those proficiencies and still needs a challenge, are they taking? the proficiency training that they've already know? Well, I mean, I think, you know, probably in certain circumstances, if, if a student really is at a grade level above the grade they're in, then you're probably talking about the possibility of, of moving them up a grade if that's what's best for their educational needs and there's, you know, considering social and, and other needs. Yeah, I think that, that teachers are trying for students who need more challenge to, to make sure they get them. And then, of course, once you get to kind of the later middle school level and high school level, um, you know, there is more room for kids to grow and advance at different rates. And, and you know, at high school, now with community-based learning and other options, you know, the, the opportunities for advancement and challenge are, are really much broader than, than they well, were. Well, Matt McLean's been doing community-based learning for a long while. Yep. And that's a hugely growing program. And as we put more resources into that, uh, that's one of the most popular programs in the middle at the high school. What kind so. of resources are we throwing in the math <coughs> program? Um, you know, he just has he has uh, he actually just did a presentation on it, but you know, he has uh, three or four people working. In fact, right, he's gone from um, kind of the 
kind of doing it solo to now being director of a program that has you know three or four staff people who are uh, you know making sure that that there's rigor in the programs that are doing outreach to the community that are making sure that that kids can get where they need to get um, so those are relatively new things and and as a result it's both expanded the program and also added a level of, of kind of rigor and consistency so you know, even though people have different placements throughout the community um, they're getting a consistent level of, of supervision and structure to their their programs speaking of getting kids where they need to go how's the um, school busing of middle school kids doing the school busing of middle school kids has been I think uh, well appreciated throughout the community I've, I've heard a lot particularly from uh, middle school parents who live somewhat more on the outskirts, who, who work, who have busy schedules. Um, they're feeling that they know their kid can get to school safely in the morning without them taking them, which some of them don't have time. And I think also after school now, they, they know that you know, their kids can go home. And How is that program doing? We um, replaced what community connections yes. with another after school? Entity. All things I've heard have been have been positive. It's it's increased capacity. Um, you know, we've kept uh, Drew McNaughton on as as a uh, as an after school coordinator, so he's been able to expand his work um, and I think really kind of focus on the things that he likes to do. So it's it's thus far it's the hiccups have been few and. Um, the and it's self-sustaining, it's staying within its budget? It is staying within its budget. Um, I wanted to get to an issue that we discussed last time that yes. we discussed this, and we'll discuss next time that yeah. we discuss it, because it's a real issue in terms of parents yes. and the community at large, school safety. And I know that that, that weighs on the board yeah. tremendously as it weighs on you know, the entire community. It's in the background. How are we doing in terms of school safety? I think we're doing a fantastic job in, in terms of school safety. I mean, Libby has really concentrated on some programs to make sure that teachers are trained for an event. We've got um, we've got a relationship with the police department where we've got a member of the police department who's basically responsible for coordinating with the schools and, and being present. We've had that schools. for a while, but we've it was in terms of. Um, drugs and, and things like that is well, it now in terms of school safety well, well? that's definitely a part of of that um, yeah I think we've put measures in place to ensure that that our teachers are trained and know what to do um, Libby just recently went to a, a training on on school safety and, and the thinking on that has evolved quite a bit as unfortunately we've had experiences across the country to learn from so it's it's definitely well a you get concern. a buzzer to get into the school now yeah yeah exactly um, but it's it's even more than that. It's uh, it's how how teachers are being trained to react in in an active situation. An active situation being an active shooter situation. Exactly, or some other active threat. What about parents coming in? Those 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 are gun free zones. Yes. Yes. Teachers with guns. Uh, we do not want teachers with guns. Why not? Uh, for a variety of reasons. One, you know, teachers are educators. They're not, they're not cops. Um, you, you know, the presence of a gun can lead to accidents. Um, yeah, and, and teachers just aren't trained and it's unrealistic to think they get the training to, to react in a situation like that. There are much better ways to keep kids safe. Um, and the things that teachers are being trained in, you know, for instance, and this is kind of morbid to think about, but you know, the the previous training was around things like just duck and cover. And what they found is that uh, actually kids should be evacuated and, and moved out because when people just sit and cover, it can take a while for cops to get there and, and quell the situation. Um, and you oftentimes have sitting ducks. Is evacuation training um, for kids traumatic? We do, not, we do fire training on a routine yeah, basis. Yeah, they're not doing that level of training with kids. Um, and there's, there was a real conscious decision that that is too traumatic for them. Basically, uh, what studies have shown is, is kids will follow directions of the teachers. And if the teachers know what to do, if there's a situation where action has to be taken, um, the kids will follow the teachers. And we do not need to put kids through 
uh, you know, drills like that because it, it is traumatic and it, you know, it, it, it makes them thinking about things that they, they don't need to think about. Um, staying in the school on social issues, yeah. religious freedom in the schools, where, has the board addressed that at all? Uh, yeah, we had a policy. Um, yeah, I think both our community values and our view of the school is the school should be a place where all people feel um, included and equal. And, uh, you know, bringing, uh, you know, bringing religion into the schools in, in ways that makes people not feel included is, is, is something that, that we're not supportive of. At least I'm not supportive of, and I don't think the board as a whole is. And I know that, uh, you know, the administration has taken steps to make sure that, you know, around holiday times, uh, that we don't promote certain religion over others. Is a student allowed to wear clothing that expresses their religion? Oh, I, I think a student absolutely is, but the school itself um, is is not going to uh, right, right. promote but students, symbols. But individual students can still wear a cross. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, an individual student can come in and, you know, that's... That's, that's within their free speech rights. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of free speech, what about the political rights of students? Uh, are, are students allowed to, to wear political buttons? Are they allowed... Where would a student run afoul expressing a political opinion in our school district? Yeah, I think basically if, if it caused some sort of, of safety issue, if it w was intended to um, intimidate, intimidate a certain you know, set of students or student, um, or, and I don't know the legal standard exactly, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase right. as, as close as I can, uh, or if it was something that was intended to you know, incite violence or you know, other, but. You know, or just obscenity. Maybe, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure exactly. Is the student newspaper at, at MHS, uh, is that edited by teachers? Or? I don't think so, okay. uh, but I but but I'm not again these are these sure. are I'm things. I'm not 100 sure, but I don't I don't think it is. Um, drugs at the school. How yeah. do you think we're doing? I mean, uh, for years, you know, it, it's been a wink wink situation in terms of we know it's there. Yeah, we know it's there. I mean, my understanding is that um, yeah, we we definitely have use of substances that ideally we would not have. Um, I have not gotten the impression that it is a severe problem, although of course, it, it, I think- You, you know, have younger children. Yeah, well, and, uh, but I hear, yeah, I hear enough. Um, it's, you know, obviously y you don't want kids doing things that are, that are unhealthy or unsafe. Um, or illegal. Or illegal. Um, but I think compared to some of the problems that some other schools are having, we are, we are not in the, we are not in this type of situation. Well, I'm, I'm going to take you to an area where I would say, yeah. I don't know if I were you. Has decriminalization had any impact whatsoever on marijuana use in I, high I, school? I don't know. You know, because that, that's a reality up here. And the fear was that decriminalization would bleed into a younger clientele. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't is know. Is that discussed going. at all by the board, or? Uh, it hasn't really been discussed, no, I think, I think or is we, that brought to you by the community at all as a concern? Not, okay. Not much, I mean, I think that. That's Montpelier. <laughs> <laughs> it's Montpelier, but I also, um, I think one of the best ways to get, to get students involved in things other than drugs is to give them alternatives for healthy engagement. And I, I think one of the reasons we probably have drug use that's not as problematic as, as other communities is we have a supportive community where kids can do a lot of And you have good things. ultimate Frisbee teams. Ex yeah, exactly. Well, that's what they're doing. They're playing ultimate Frisbee and <laughs> doing soccer. other things. Yeah, and soccer. Yeah. That's uh, this is one where people who aren't on the inside of this conversation sit and say, huh? Transgender and nonconforming students. Yes. It's it's a major initiative within the school district. Yes. Yes, it's it's a it is certainly important to. Can you explain that to people who know absolutely nothing about that initiative? When it started, what it involves, and what just 
what the objective and goal is. So when did it start? Uh, I think it's been an evolving conversation over several years as the district has come to the realization that we do have um, gender nonconforming students. And um, you know, they face some really huge challenges. We, we don't have a society that's necessarily accepting of them um, or that's welcoming of them. And, you know, a, so a society or a community? I would say both. I mean, I think I think as a, the society as a whole is not accepting, and I think we're trying to wrestle as a community with being a place where where we are as a, where we are accepting. Now, is that community a broader community beyond the schools that you're talking about, or are you specifically talking about the school community? Because there are there. It's well, a Venn diagram. Yeah. Well, I mean, the board is obviously related for the school community, but you know, the there's synergy between the school community and the broader community. And I think if the school can be an example of a place that um, is welcoming of gender nonconforming students and transgender students, uh, you know, in, in the ways that, that we design bathrooms and the ways that we, you know, ac accept them and the ways that we give them support, um, you know, when they go through uh, a gender change, um, then hopefully we can be a lesson for the community. and you know, people who, and, and get people asking the question, you know, what does this mean and, and why should I care? Okay, in terms of process, I imagine it came from parents mm -hmm. and then went to the board. Well, I think a lot of it came from students, too. I think, you know, students that, uh, you know, that, um, you know, transgender students and, and students that were, you know, facing big life decisions and, and having to, you know, change genders in a, a school environment were saying, I, "We need support for this. We, 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 yeah, this is this is a big deal, and this is something that that we need acceptance of, but not just acceptance, but support." So it went to the board. What did the board do at that point? They have a concern in front of students who feel that they're not accepted in the mm -hmm. school, fully accepted yeah. as they feel they should. You probably have parents saying that my child is not fit and, and other children that we know under similar circumstance right. are not feeling welcomed in this school which I think is the core of, of yeah. the school's mission is that every child feel welcomed and strong and healthy exactly so what did the board do at that point uh, yeah we put in place policies that explicitly state that this is a value and a priority of the board and the district um, and you know that instructs the administration to you know to take to take measures to ensure that that we have, you know, policies and support and resources in place to make sure that that our transgender now when did this come to the admin? Was Libby on at this point, or was this before Libby and Brian yeah. Ricca? Uh, I think some of it some of it definitely was was during Brian's reign, and then um, yeah, as part of the Black Lives Matter flag, we we put an equity policy in place um, and worked with students on that and worked with Libby on that. Uh, and then as part of putting new policies in place for the new merged district, we, the, you know, that also uh, became very important that we Did you get any parental resistance on this? I mean, it is, everyone's not in agreement on uh, this being a priority. Yeah, there, on the bathroom issue, there certainly were some parents who weighed in um, with, with questions about that. Uh, you know, the, you know, uncomfortable that there were bathrooms that, you know, um, multiple genders could use. Were there hearings on that? Did the school board hear parents or, or was it a, a, a thing where it was handled by Libby and her staff? Did it make it to oh, the no, board? Oh, we, no. Yeah, we, we definitely discussed it on the board level. I mean, we heard from students. We heard from some community members. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, been a, it's been an evolving discussion. There's been several board meetings where it's been on the agenda to some extent. What at this point remains to be implemented? <coughs> um, <coughs> I think this is because uh, this is one of those issues like racism that I don't think just it's ongoing. goes away. Uh, in fact, I know it doesn't go away. This is, yeah, you know, we're going to have to keep checking in and making sure uh, that we're truly being welcoming. Um, and it's something that I think we're going to constantly be on top of. You know, th the fact of the matter is, I think we've taken a lot of positive step. But I think there are still uh, transgender students, um, you know, LGBT, the LGBTQ. Yes, thank you. Um, students 
uh, who are not feeling welcome in our schools and who what, are. You know, again, you've got your ear to the ground on this. Yes. For those of us who don't watch your meetings or don't have parents talking yes. or don't even have kids in the school, as we don't, what are we hearing from those parents that, that's left? How, why, if we're addressing the issue, what is the lingering left, you know, on this? Well, I think a lot of their students are still facing... Um, I mean, I could see it in the broader society, but uh, again, I come back to our son who's in graduate school. This was an issue that was what? kind of worked out in a lot of way. It wasn't transgender in those days, but gay students weren't stigmatized in the least, you know, 10, yeah. 12 years ago. Well, I mean, I think there's definitely been advancements, but I, I think, um, you know, both students and parents of uh, LGBTQ um, students and, and transgender students are finding that, you know, there are subtle ways that they're not being accepted. And, you know, just because you So put the a, comparison to racism, in a sense, is yeah, apt. Exactly. Just because you put it's, a... It's a small minority group within a predominantly white school. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of it is, is implicit and... Um, yeah, also just because you put policies in place doesn't mean that you change culture, doesn't mean that, that small little statements that, that, um, that aren't so small because they, you Well, know, they're personal. Yeah, they're personal or they, they, you know, they carry a weight. I mean, you've got, a, 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 again, a predominantly white, heterosexual, um, you know, relatively educated culture. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of privilege there. And I think getting, getting a lot of folks to realize their privilege and how their actions impact, um, you know, minority segments within our population, uh, that that's, takes ongoing work. See, now we live fairly close to um, Union Elementary. Yep. And walking back home one evening, we saw an extremely well-attended meeting on this topic. Mm -hmm. Are those regular meetings? that are being held at the schools? Uh, that was a, a series actually put on by uh, Mara, who's the new, uh, new board, board member, member um, through Outright Vermont. Uh, that was, I think, a series of a few meetings. Uh, they're semi-regular, but they're not a regular thing. Um, and yes, we would, like, we would like more of them. And, and again, that constant education from I think a variety of angles is is extremely Boy, this, important. Again, this dates me as almost like your dad. Do they still have a gay straight alliance at the high school? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, that that's been going on for a long while. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it's been renamed. As it probably should be. Yes. As it should have been a long time ago. Um, so basically, this is an issue that you feel that people feel good about that change? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we, it's, it reflects the board's values, it reflects my values, it reflects the community's values. I mean, um, to the extent that I don't feel good about it, it's to the extent that I, I feel we've got a lot of work to do. I feel this is, even though we're well ahead of many other communities, I think, um, we, we still have a lot of blind spots and we still have a lot of work to do. It's, it's gonna take quite a long time. Are there other social issues, social awareness issues that the board is dealing with? Uh, you know, I, I still think that a lot of our students of color um, do not feel that they have the type of, of welcoming environment that, that they really need to succeed. Uh, and that's everything from, um, you know, not feeling fully included Socially, uh, having you know comments directed against them that clearly have have you know uh, racist intent or or racist uh, implications behind them. Uh, it's fully integrating a, a curriculum that that includes uh, you know the history of of African American ancestors. You know, do we still have a history that's largely male dominated um, that leaves a lot of of you know the female story out as well, um, you know certainly the L LBTGQ community uh, is not well included in a lot of our curriculum. I mean I think we're doing a better job, but um, you know we're still, you know it's still George Washington and the cherry tree to some extent. Do the kids in Roxbury feel fully welcome? Uh, they've got the long bus ride, and then 
they leave. Is there a problem there? Um, yeah, my understanding is that uh, you know the integration has been a little uneven. I think some students have felt very welcome. I think uh, for some students there's been uh, a little more of a challenge integrating. Is there uh, something that the board can do, you know, to change the human heart? <laughs> Uh, I, I think, again, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's education, it's giving those students... It's also only been two years. <coughs> yeah, it's only been two years. Um, I think time will help with some of it, and, um, you know, giving, giving all the students the support they have, you know, socially and emotionally to, you know, to integrate as well. Um, you know, but uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's been, by and large, good, but not perfect.